We've been um, studying the Sermon on the Mount. It was supposed to be a three-part sermon, but um, we decided to make it into a fourth, um, four parts. And today will be our last um, part of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, so I would like to invite you to um, open the Word of God to Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to do a quick review so that um, we can build up to the climax, if I may, towards the conclusion part of the Sermon on the Mount. So, we already by now, all of you should know that this is perhaps one of the most important speeches that Jesus uh, spoke because this is inaugural speech. He's basically assuming himself as the king, the king, and uh, he is allowing the people to know that the heavenly kingdom uh, is starting and he is assuming his role as the king. And uh, he's establishing what that kingdom would look like and what would be the citizens of the heavenly kingdom would look like. So this is him reminding those who are listening what and how they should live their life in preparation for them to become citizens of the heavenly, uh, heavenly kingdom. So, we learned that it started with God blessing them. He said, uh, blessed are, happy are. So he was pointing to the qualities that we would need to have. So he covered eight Beatitudes. Uh, to end the Beatitudes, he spoke of how we will be persecuted for Christ's sake. So if you are being persecuted for Christ's sake, you know, you should be thankful that you are being persecuted for Christ's sake. Amen? And you know, the time of persecution will come. Trust me, I'm doing a uh, baptismal uh, class with, um, um, you know, my dear brother here who just started coming, Kevin Willis. Um, he's seated at the back. In fact, we already have two baptisms scheduled this year. One will be on October 30th, and another one will be on December 4th. And we have a young lady who will be getting baptized. She's also doing baptismal study. Um, but the last study that we did together, we talked about, does God expect us to be persecuted for his namesake? I believe so. And, and you have to be prepared to be persecuted for Christ's sake. And then after the beatitude, he talked about how we need to be the light and the salt, the salt and the light of this world. This world need flavor, this world need light. Just as the song that was sang, you know, let Christ's love shine through me in the dark. Let Christ shine on us and may his love what transmitted out from us to this dark world. And then he talked about um, how to fulfill the law that the Torah, that the Jewish nation was fixated on. It was all about Torah, about obeying the law. And what is interesting is that when Jesus did his earthly ministry, many accused him of breaking the law, remember? You know, soon we'll be starting another series on the seven miracles that Jesus performed on Sabbath days. But every time Jesus performed a miracle for our sake, he was accused of breaking the law. Isn't that interesting? So here he's establishing that do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And he was reminding them, you are saying that you're not committing sins of commission, and you are saying you're okay, you're righteous, because you have not committed sins of commission. But he is tr trying to open their eyes to see there are also what we call sins of omission, such as loving our enemies. So now he talks about murder, he reminds them, you know, the Bible teaches thou shalt not kill, and because you do not kill, that you think you're okay. But, but he was reminding them, if you have hateful thought, if you're angry against your brother or sister, you have committed a murder. He goes further by saying, 
you know, about adultery. Well, you say you have not slept with your neighbor's wife, but even the thought that you would have entertained, you have committed adultery. He's elevating the, the kind of the character and, and the, the life um, quality or life characteristics of those who are to be in heaven, whose thoughts are pure and who's elevated, who are uh, spiritually elevated. And he talked about divorce, how you should not just get divorced unless there's um, adultery involved. And he talks about oaths. And then he concludes the first part, at least, of the Sermon on the Mount as it is divided into three parts by reminding them what? You're used to hearing eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You know, they were given the permission. In fact, it was okay for them to, you know, take someone else's eye. And this is the reason why even today, the Israelis will retaliate, retaliate, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, because that was the teachings as they perceive of Moses. But Jesus was saying, you know, no, that's not, you know, what the heavens a kingdom, heavenly kingdom citizens should be like. No, you should not punch back. In fact, if someone slaps on your cheek, then turn the other cheek. If someone asks you to carry their bag for one mile, do that for two miles instead of just one. And he's actually telling them, you know, in my opinion, it's okay for you to be gullible and naive and at times be taken advantage of. I mean, certainly you would not be happy if your child comes home and say, Mom, today, you know, my classmate wanted my t-shirt, my favorite t-shirt. So what I did, I gave my t-shirt and I also gave him or her my jacket. And you'll be saying, you are foolish. Why did you do that? Why did you do such a thing? But that's exactly what the Bible is teaching. If someone wants your shirt, give him your gown as well. You know, Jesus is saying that the reason why heaven will be a special place is because there are a lot of innocent people. Sometimes children are so innocent, right? When I was a kid, you know, at the time, you, know, you can't eat ice cream as you wish. Uh, by now, you know that I eat ice cream time to time. So if a classmate will have this hard ice cream bar, you know what I'm talking about, and we'll go to him and say, can I have a little bite, you know, little bite? And, and he's conflicted, but, but often children, they like to share, right? And then so I'll have my mouth open, just very tiny, small um, bit, and I say, I'll just have this much bite. And then when they present their ice cream, you know, I get a huge bite, you know, and make my classmate cry and, you know, and all that stuff. But the thing is, there's that innocence in children that they're willing to give. And this is what he was reminding. And he was talking about loving enemies. He said, the Bible, you know, you learn that love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But he said, what? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. As the children of God, as sons and daughters of God, we cannot react the same way how people who do not know God reacts. And then in going to the next part of the sermon, you know, it talks about you know, um, how when you are doing generous act towards others, don't show off. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Care for them. And he taught them about the model of prayer, that the prayer should be about God's will, seeking God's will, that His will be done in your life. And then he talks about fasting. You're not fasting for a show. In fact, you should take shower, you should comb your head, hair, and put your best clothes so that people will not sympathize that you're fasting. You're not fasting for show. Religiosity is not for a show, he's saying. And then he talks about store treasures in heaven, not here on earth where um, it can get corrupted or destroyed or even taken away from you by thieves. And he's saying store your wealth, store your treasures in heaven. Every time he's speaking, he's reminding them, focus on heaven, focus on what is to come rather than 
being consumed, preoccupied with the life that you are in right now. But isn't that, you know, seem to be hard that you are so preoccupied trying to pay the bills, to come out with the tuition for your children, you know, to pay the bills, and days pass, pass by, you know, and you're just struggling to keep your head above the water. But he's reminding, this is not your home Store your treasures in heaven. And then he's saying, are you worried? Is that why you're preoccupied? And he said, what? Do not worry. And this is why I preached about last week. Do not worry about what you will eat and what you will dress. And he said, look at the birds. Look at the sparrows. You know, no one feeds the birds, but God feeds. And look at the lilies and flowers. No one feeds those flowers, but God clothes them. And he's reminding them that how much more, how much more that God would care for you, that he will care for you so that you don't have to worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry for itself. This is what he was teaching. And now going into the last part of his Sermon on the Mount. Now going to chapter 7, this is how he starts. He talks about not judging other people. He said, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Don't judge others, Jesus is saying, so that you won't be judged. How many of you enjoy being judged? How many of you, being in, how many of you enjoy being judged? I don't like to be judged. Verse 2, for whatever standard you use to judge others will be used to judge you. And whatever measurement you use to measure others will be used to measure you. So he's saying, if you don't want to be judged, don't judge. And why is he saying that? There's a very important principle in it. It's because you do not know their motive. <clears throat> Have you ever had instances where you said things out of the goodness of your heart, you sincerely care for that person, but the reaction that you get is total opposite than what you expected. As if you said something horrible, you're just trying to say something nice, and then they react. You know, we're a byproduct of the experiences that we were subjected to. So therefore, if I'm used to people slapping my face, Okay? When I see a hand extended to me, I'm looking at that hand as, okay, this person is going to slap my face again, and you're going to back off, when that hand can easily be the hand of assistance. We do not know. We cannot read people's minds. Only God can. For that reason, because you do not know their motive, you must not judge. Give them the benefit of doubt. Instead of being suspicious of their intents or what they're trying to do, give them the benefit of doubt. Why? Because don't you want the benefit of doubt? That people would not judge you, would not judge you, but rather give you, give you the benefit of doubt. So, now verse 3. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye? The speck. The King James Version will use the word mot. You know, the, it's from the Greek word karpos, a mere chip or a splinter or dried wood or shaft, a tiny little thing, okay? The, the, the New International Version will translate this as um, the speck of uh, sawdust, sawdust. It's a tiny little thing. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eyes? Don't you notice the plank that is, that's in your own eye? Plank here is from the word dokos, beam. This is how King James Version uses beam, log, or plank. A piece of timber used in the construction of a house. You know, the Arabs will say the cross, um, cross woods. You know, when you look at the house structure, you know, before they put the roof and the walls and whatnot, they have those, what, woods that is connecting. This is what it's referring to. You know, there is a speck of sawdust in your eye, or, or you are looking for a speck uh, in, uh, of a sawdust from someone else's eye, yet, yet in your eye you have this cross beam, this plank, this logging. That's quite humorous, is it not? 
Someone is going to someone and say, Oh, by the way, I see that little tiny little speck in your eye. Yet, when they are looking at the one who is pointing that out, he has a huge plank in his eye. This is what Jesus is saying. By the way, if Jesus is here, God who sees all things. We know the story of a woman caught in the act of adultery. They were ready to punish her, stone her. But what happened? What happened? Jesus quietly, he, he, he stooped down and he starts simply writing down the hidden scenes. Is there any one of you here who could say, Pastor, I have not seen, I have a clean conscience that I can throw stones to any of these members in this room, you know, as often as I would like because I have never offended anyone I've never seen. If you say that, you would be a liar. So if you, if you, have planks in your eye. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye? Don't you notice the plank that's in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take out the speck from your eye when you have a plank in your own eye? You're being hypocritical, hypocritical. First, get rid of the plank that's in your own eye. Then you will be able to see clearly to take out the speck from your brother's eye. Is God really, is Jesus really saying, yeah, you remove your plank first and then go back and look for those specks in the eyes of your brothers and sisters? No. This is rhetorical. He's basically saying, don't you even think about judging each other because your plank is bigger than their speck. Verse 6. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. What is Jesus saying here? You know, at one point that you have to you know, recognize that some of the things that are happening around you is a waste of time, meaning that you should not give your time of the day. You should not give your energy for those things because you are set apart. You are set apart for holy use. Then why would you participate in those activities? Of people trying to fault find, look for specks in the eyes of other people. After having said that, now he goes and says this promise. You know, isn't it exciting time to time, you know, growing up, you know, um, I read, or I'm sorry, I memorized the, 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 13 Sabbath Bible verses. I don't know whether we do that anymore. Maybe we should start that. Maybe we should have our children on the 13th Sabbath come here and recite their Bible verses together. I mean, I used to do that when I was a kid. Have you done it? And any child that will recite all 13 Bible verses will say, well done, okay? But time to time, you know, when you are reading the Bible, some of those gems of the scripture, it it comes out and you say, ah, this is where it came from. And this is what the Bible is saying. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Yes, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. After having spoken of the heavenly kingdom, he's saying, if you ask. Here the word ask is a present imperative uh, and what I mean by present imperative, it means it can also be translated as keep on asking. If you keep on asking every day, every moment, and the kingdom of God will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. The door to the heavenly kingdom will be opened to you. Verse 8. Everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks has the door open for them. Verse 9. Would any of you give your son a stone if he asks for bread? So now he talked about storing treasures in heaven, and he talks about focus on heaven. Don't get preoccupied by your daily um, needs and all that, and except, you know, store your treasures in heaven and he's saying prepare for heavenly kingdom but at the same time he's also mindful that we do also struggle with our daily needs and this is what he says he's assuring those who are there who are still worried about the bread the, the fish the daily bread that they would need to have and this is what he said would any of you give your son a stone if he asked for bread or if he asked for fish, would you give him a snake? 
you know, why did God use here the, the bread and the fish? Because this is what people ate then. When Jesus fed 5,000 men, you know, he gave them what? Bread and fish. So this is, as Jesus is talking about bread and, and, and fish, they're talking about their daily needs. And he's saying, would any of you give your son a stone if he asked for bread? Or if he asked for fish, would you give him a snake? Just imagine that. Daddy, I'm hungry. Can I have a bread? Here, son, here is a stone. You know, Daddy, I am hungry. Can I have some fish? Sure, here is a snake. It doesn't make sense, right? And now Jesus is saying, he's using human experience and say, if the earthly father would not do that, if earthly father would not do that, now verse 11, so if even you who are evil, you all are sinners, but you would not give snake in place of fish and the rock in place or stone in place of stone, if the, in the evil, you know, fathers would not do that, but know to give good things to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask Him? Amen? Brothers and sisters, you know, there's nothing that thrills the pastor than hearing that how God is blessing you so much that you're getting promotions, you're getting six-digit you know, salary, and you are moving into uh, four, five-bedroom houses. I'm not asking you to live in a one-bedroom apartment. That's not what I'm asking. God will bless you, and God will increase you. But the thing is, seek ye the first, the kingdom of God. Amen? And all these things will be added unto you. I will say to you, I would rather have you stay in the tent and life is so miserable. You say, I wish I will be in heaven soon. Jesus, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. I'm sick and tired of living in this hut. I would rather have you live in the hut and await for the heavenly kingdom to come rather than live in a mansion and your thing to God. Just tarry just a little bit longer. Jesus, just, I've been working for 40, 50 years of my life and allow me to enjoy my life just a little bit longer. If that is the case, you know, I pray that you live in a tent rather than live in a mansion. But here he's saying, but you know, trust in me. I will bless you. Whatever needs you have, I will give you. I will provide your daily bread. I will do that. He's saying, seek ye the first, the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. And now verse 12. Treat others the way you want them to treat you. This sums up the law and the prophets. Now, King James Version 12, and this is how you know this verse very well. Therefore, all things, whatever ye would that man should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. New International Version translates this way. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. And we call this what? The golden rule. The golden rule. Do unto others what you want them to do to you. During that time, they had other expressions. That is, don't do things that you don't want them to do to you. Okay? Don't hurt others if you don't want if you don't want them to hurt you. So the way how they are used to thinking and processing is that don't do mean things to other people if you don't want them to do mean things. And Jesus changes that and say, don't focus on negatives and don't think like, oh, I should not do mean things because I don't want people to be mean to me. He's saying. Elevate yourself. Act like you're the citizens of heavenly kingdom. Act like you're children of our heavenly father. And he's saying what? He's saying what? Do unto others what they, what you want them to do to you. It'll be nice if on a Sabbath morning someone comes to me and say, Hey, how was your week? And give you a big hug, don't you? Don't you want someone to call you and say, how are you doing? I haven't seen you in the church. You know, you know, don't you wish that someone will just do some acts of kindness? 
Don't you want to experience these things the more that you get to meet your church family? Do unto others what you want them to do to you. Don't wait, on, wait until they come to you. You go to them. This is the golden rule. Take care of them because they will take care of you. And then verse 13, I have to move quickly here. He says, enter by the narrow gate or straight gate, not straight, but straight, S-T-R-A-T. -A. You know, it's, it seems like there's no difference between straight and straight. Maybe there is a difference. But we are talking about straight. You know, enter through the straight gate, narrow gate, or narrow entrance. Yes, it requires challenge. Yes, it's going to be difficult. The reason why I'm wearing this white gown today is because our, one of our children made a decision to follow Jesus. You are entering into a narrow gate. You're, you know, the standard is high. If you want to live that righteous living, yes, it's not easy. Because our body is programmed to think selfishly, act selfishly. It's easier to take than give. But if you learn to give, that is entering into a narrow entrance. That you are choosing to live your life for God and others than live selfishly. Don't we have enough selfish people in this world? Wouldn't it be refreshing time to time we have some, you know, some naive and gullible people who will come to your assistance and they will not only carry one bag that you're carrying but they're willing to carry two bags in fact if there's anyone who should be gullible and naive and innocent it should be Christians I believe Christians should be taken advantage of I think that's what Jesus is saying of course it sounds so foolish is it not your child comes home and says you know someone asked me for my t-shirt and I gave my t-shirt and my jacket as well and you will say you are so foolish but you know what in this dry world we need some gullible Christians who is are willing to carry their load even two or three miles Enter by the narrow entrance. For the entrance is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many travel that way. But the entrance is narrow and the way is difficult that leads to life. And only a few find it. Live a selfless life because at the end you will find the heavenly kingdom. And that you will find yourself being citizens of the heavenly kingdom. Now I will be wrapping this up. Now he's talking about the true and false prophets and true and false disciples. Watch out for false prophets who come wearing sheep's clothing, but who on the inside are vicious wolves. You can recognize them by their fruits. Do people harvest grapes from, the, uh, from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every good tree produces good fruit, while a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. So you will recognize them by their fruits. One of the seven pillars of the Minnetonka Seventh-day Adventist Church that we'll be focusing on for the next seven years is Godly Church. Godly church is comprised with godly leaders and godly members. It starts from me. It starts from the elders. People should see that godliness in us. Somehow they say, you know, our elders are different. Our pastors are different. Our members are different. Every time I come into this church, you know, I feel like I'm being detoxed. detoxed. I feel like that this toxicity that I am experiencing in this world is taken away from me. Don't you want to feel that process of being purified? That you come into this church and you feel like, now I can breathe in this air. Now I can be fully accepted here. Now I can come here as who I am and I can experience God's grace and mercy. How barren this world would be that you come to church and you get hurt by who you consider as your brothers and sisters. Now, true and false disciples. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. Again, will. God's will. God's will is for you to love one another. God's will is for you to love your enemies. God's will is for you to pray for your enemies. God's you know, God's will is that you be different than others. 
who are saturated in the worldly worldviews. Many will say to me at the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name? Let me tell you, to be a citizen of heaven is not a mere religiosity. It's not by title, Pastor. You know, I have been a Seventh-day Adventist for the last 70 years. So what? If I don't see the evidence of Christ-likeness in you. You know, actually, I'm preaching to myself. If you cannot stand me, there's something wrong with me. Can you imagine? One time I said to my wife, and this is from, from some other you know, experience that I had before, and I was having a headache. I'm like, oh. And then we were all both troubled by what was going on, and I told her, but what if that the person becomes our neighbor when we go to heaven? Have you ever thought about it? Look around. Look at the person behind you, in front of you, next to you. Or look at me. If I become your neighbor, would that be a heaven? We're like, oh, pastor, you should not have said that. But are you getting the point? Many will say to me at the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name? Then I will tell them, I never knew you. Leave me, you people who practice wickedness. I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doors. Now, to conclude, this is the illustration he gives. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. What's the purpose of you listening about Sermon on the Mount repeatedly from me and from reading the Bible if you are not going to practice that into your daily living? Brothers and sisters, start loving your enemies. Start praying for your enemies. Because it will not only become tolerable, but you will start having that empathy and sympathy towards that soul. Don't uh, repay evil with evil. Pray for the people who spit on you. Pray for people who short sight you. Pray for those who backbite you. At the end, you will inherit the heavenly kingdom. The rain came down. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the stream rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus finished explaining these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he taught like someone with authority and not like their religious teachers who was living in pretense pretense of perfection, pretense of righteousness. When you find the good people, can you not feel it? Don't you just enjoy their presence? Because you can smell in the air good spirit. At the end of associating with these people, you can feel your soul being elevated. You feel that there is a reconciliation. You feel that there is healing. You feel there is a restoration to the image of God in which we were all created.